Praise the Lord, First Baptist. We are so excited that you made the decision to experience the love at the broad today. We pray that everything you experience will encourage you in your faith journey. To our guests, welcome to the broad, where we are guided by our mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We would like to connect with you, so text the broad to 22828 and we'll follow up to get more info to stay connected with you. If you're streaming online, make sure you like, subscribe, and share this stream and tell everyone to tune in with you. Stay tuned for this month's announcements. There's something for everyone on the broad. We have a host of groups, ministries, and events for children, teens, young adults, seniors, career development, performing arts, health, and more. If you would like to get engaged, you can email info at fbcrbroad.org and simply write, I want to get engaged at the broad. Now, let's see what's going on at the broad. Join a Sunday school class every Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. to grow in the Word of God and strengthen your faith in your life's journey. Emphasis month. Is it I am, you are? No. She, she is. is. She 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 is. One, two, check. One. She is. Blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her. We would like to invite all of the women of First Baptist Church and our community to celebrate with us for our Women's Emphasis Weekend, October the 21st through the 23rd. There will be something for everyone, and you would not want to miss this. Our registration begins today in the Grand Lobby, and we hope to see you there. She is what he said. She is back. Women's Ministry of First Baptist Broad would like to cordially invite you to Women's Emphasis Weekend, October 21st through 23rd. Join us as we return to fellowship, return to service, and return to worship. Friday, October 21st is Ladies' Night Out. Join us as we convene on the Crosstown Concourse for food, fun, and fellowship. Time is at 6.30. On Saturday, October 22nd is a day of service. Join us as we present a community baby shower for those impacted in the Binghamton area. Time starts at 8.30 a.m. All are encouraged to join. Sunday, October 23rd, is where we wrap up our dynamic weekend with wonderful word and scripture. And join us after service for brunch. Hey, First Baptist, if you're looking for a safe place to come shoot ball on a weekly basis, Look no further than First Baptist Church. Starting September 14th at 6 o'clock, we will have open gym started back for everyone, members of the community, members of your family. And if you have any questions, feel free to call me, Keenan, at 901-323-2429, extension 222. Or you can email me at communityoutreach at fbcbroad.org. 
Brighter Days is a grief support group that exists to provide a safe space for healing through conversation with certified grief counselors and support staff. Brighter Days happens every second and fourth Sunday in person at 9.15 a.m. in the Victory Center. If you would like to know more information, email congregationalcare at fbcbroad.org. Thursday Night Man Cave. Save the date for the next Thursday Night Man Cave on October 27th at 6.30 p.m. Men, make sure you connect and get engaged with the men's ministry by emailing mensgroup at fbcbroad.org. Scripture says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. The FBCD Cup is a golf tournament hosted by the FBCD Men's Ministry. The next tournament is Saturday, October 29th at Fox Meadows Golf Course. All interested golf players can sign up Sundays in the Grand Lobby. If you would like to know more information, email mensgroup at fbcbroad.org or call the office at 901-323-2429. Save the date for the annual Fall Festival and Trunk or Treat this Sunday, October 30th. We are now accepting donations of candy and volunteers to participate in Trunk or Treat. If you'd like to sign up as a volunteer or would like to know more information, email kendramore.fbcb at gmail.com. Every fifth Sunday in the Memphis neighborhood of Binghampton, many are being obedient to the Word of God. The importance of the church is not the building, nor being locked up in the four walls of our sanctuary, but getting out and actually being and doing what God has commissioned us to do. Go ye therefore and make disciples. And that is what Take It to the Streets is all about. In Matthew 28, 18 through 19, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. John 14, 12 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. We bring the word of God to those that need his presence, his word fulfilling the whole left in their hearts. If you want to volunteer, be a part of our church home or are yearning to know more about Christ and his goodness, email for more info at info at fbcbroad.org or call 901-323-2429 and let's take it to the streets. What if Please stand as we read the devotion together today out loud. Psalms 95. Come, let us sing a joyful song to the Lord. Come, let us proclaim to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us joyfully songs to him. Come, let us bow down and worship him. Let us kneel before the Lord who made us. He, for he is our God, and we are the people he shepherds, the flock he gathers. Lord, shall we pray now? Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of grace and mercy. New mercies every day, God. We thank you for loving us, even in our sinful state of mind, God. We thank you for everything that you do, every blessing that you give us. For each and every breath that we take, we say thank you, Lord. We thank you for healing our aches and pains. 
Thank you for dealing with our troubles on our jobs and our homes. Thank you for blessing our kids with not being in trouble. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us in everything we do. And Jesus, we thank you for saving us from ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that you took down from heaven and saw the state of the world, God, and you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to intercede for us, God. We thank you for loving us. Jesus Christ, we pray. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, will you lift your hands in worship this morning and just tell God, thank you for another day's journey. Oh, come on, look at somebody and say, neighbor, I'm only here because the Lord has been keeping me. thankful that we have another opportunity to engage before the Lord and offer worship in sincerity and the beauty of holiness and in truth. Amen. Uh, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I'd like all of our survivors, if there are some here this morning, 
uh, or even those whom have faced the journey to please stand and let us give you a hand. Amen. Would you stand? All right. God bless you. God bless you. We know that so many people face this journey and they face it uh, sometimes without the support of many loved ones near or around them. But at First Baptist, one of the things we like to do is never let you walk alone. With that being said, on next Sunday, you will be blessed to be here at the 1030 service, especially uh, as we witness a survivor of breast cancer, uh, Dorshell Spence, who has written a wonderful book entitled Into the Gathering Clouds. Her book is really taking off. Uh, it has had many book signings in the Mid-South and throughout the United States. She is an author, she is a survivor. She's going to be here as our speaker on next Sunday at the 1030 service. Uh, one of the things that I love, and I won't give away some of the uh, talk or some of the sermon that she's gonna present, but she says she had to face breast cancer with family, faith, and finesse. So she said the finesse came in because she did not want to stop being cute while she was going through the process, amen? I think every woman in here ought to give that a hand, amen? Every man ought to give it a hand. Um, because that's a part of the journey. That's a part of the journey. And so she faced it with her family. She faced it with her faith. Uh, she faced it with her finesse in being a pretty woman while she was going through her journey. And uh, she'll share more about that. Her books will be available on next Sunday. Uh, and you will not have to buy a book because I already have one that's a gift for you. Amen. So if you are a survivor, I'm going to give you a book. Uh, matter of fact, if you'll see me after service, I have them in my office, and she will sign your book on next week. Let me share with you also uh, about the passing of one of our dear staffers, a um, person who worked at our church many years ago, Miss Jamie Davis. Uh, Jamie did succumb to an illness she and Pastor Breckenridge were both uh, stricken with issues of heart condition on the same day um, a year or so ago when Pastor Breckenridge uh, passed. And Jamie has been battling ever since. Uh, I've been with her and her family throughout this journey. Her husband, Greg, and I have walked through this. And Greg called me the other day and uh, he said to me, Jamie has passed. And so I went to be with him and he has insisted. This was. This was me and Greg's ongoing battle with each other, all right? So Jamie is his wife, but she's my member. And uh, she always told him, she, he pastors a church, and she said, oh, I'm a member of First Baptist Brawl. I just attend the church where you serve. And so Greg always told me, he said, my wife loved you more than she loved me. I said, no, she don't. Uh, she just didn't want to put that burden on you. So her, her homegoing services will be here on next Saturday at 1 p.m., 1 p.m. And the reason we're doing it at 1 p.m. Uh, for our service leaders is that the services for Pastor William Young, Dr. William Young, will be at the Healing Center at 11 a.m. And many of us are participating because William, uh, a chaplain at Methodist and a pastor at, um, at the Healing Center for many years, was a good friend to this congregation as well as to many people throughout the Mid-South. And so we're going to be there to support him. In just a moment, we're going to show a video tribute honoring the life of Pastor Willie Boyd and Pastor William Young. And we'll have that in just a few minutes. There are several other announcements that are going to be in your hearing at the end of worship. We're gonna play them again. One of them is the sign up for Taking It to the Streets. We'd like for everyone, if you have not signed up for something in the Taking It to the Streets fifth Sunday, this has been our effort to connect with community, our effort to get our church outside of the four walls and into the community uh, in various locations throughout the city. There are nursing homes, there are homeless people, there are opportunities to uh, pack the truck with clothing. Um, we, we bring a truck here where if you have clothing that you want to give, uh, to a Goodwill Center or to homeless people. Uh, we do distribute those. This is our fifth Sunday effort every fifth Sunday. And there will also be additional efforts. I think we'll have our park uh, soft opening on that day. So across the street at our park, 
watch the weather and make sure you dress accordingly. Uh, we still think we'll have a mild fall day, so we'll definitely do that. So we want to uh, come out on the fifth Sunday, but sign up as you will in the lobby on today. Uh, it's giving time. We want to bless God with our gifts on today. Listen, I have been asking and I'm going to continue to ask. We do this at the end of every year in the final quarter of the year. I call it the home stretch. Uh, I want you to give. I want you to dig a little deeper. Uh, this is important. We have many goals to accomplish. Uh, we have many things that we have to do. And I make no, I don't, I don't hide what we try to do. First of all, we're going to be a blessing to many people at Thanksgiving and at Christmas. We have, uh, we've given the people who we serve a raise. Amen. Amen. We've given the people who we serve a raise. All right, so $100 or $100 just won't feed a family of four on Thanksgiving. No, somebody said, no, ma'am. No, sir, it won't do it. Amen. So we have to raise that up. So we're going to give more. We're looking at at least $150 for those individuals just for a family of four. We go out and price a meal. And we don't, do, we don't do, you know, you don't want any generic stuff on your Thanksgiving table, right? So we try to give a first class of uh, effort for our boxes or for our gift cards. And then we want people to have the dignity of doing it for themselves. We want them to be able to go out and shop for themselves and not always receive a handout. Uh, so we are giving people a raise, all right? So that's the first goal. Uh, in this home stretch. That's why we need more, and that's why we ask for more. Secondly, I keep telling you, um, MLGW bills have gone up at the house, haven't they? Amen. So they went up at church too. Amen. Amen. So come on. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. Amen. And so y'all didn't clap for that. All right. Y'all didn't clap for it. And, and with that being said, on October the 20th, uh, there will be an open forum right here in the church where MLGW, I had a piece of paper, Craig, I may have left it in my office, um, but MLGW is going to be here in the sanctuary talking about uh, the bills and talking about everything that's going on. Uh, what time is that event? I think it's at 5 in the evening. Uh, I'll get 6 in the evening. We'll be in the Victory Center, but we want all of you to come out and weigh in. This is a community meeting. And if you have been experiencing things with your utility bills and you need to voice your opinion or if you need to understand what this switch or non-switch from TVA would mean to the individual or if you got questions about your smart meters or anything like that, please come on October the 20th at 6 p.m. And if I'm, if I'm incorrect on that, I'll correct myself at the end of worship. But definitely come, but we're experiencing that increase, and we need to be in control of that. Listen, one of the things that I have suggested to MLGW is that they have appointed commissioners on the board of MLGW that vote on rate hikes, okay? I have suggested that we make those elected positions so that we have people who represent us from the communities that we live in and that they will have our opinions in their ear if they're going to vote for our conscience and for our utility bills. Amen. There are elected utility boards across the country. Memphis is one of the few that has an appointed utility board, and we have no say-so in that, those rate hikes. And so that's another thing. And finally, towards the end of the year, uh, I always tell you this, we want to be a blessing to our staff. Amen. We want to be a blessing to our staff. Clap for that, too. That's right. Uh, Social Security has gotten an 8% raise going into next year. Uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And, and listen, I hope they give an 8% raise when I'm able to receive Social Security. But I also want to be able to compensate our staff accordingly with cost of living increase. And so I'm factoring all of those things as we go forward. And I want to make sure that we are able to uh, sustain a first class staff, people who don't mind working in church, not people who come to church and just say, I'm just here and I'm looking for a job. I want people who want to be here and who are excited to be here. Amen. All right. Come on. Let's pray about our giving on today. Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless you now. Uh, Lord, we're very transparent about what you do. You tell us what to do. and You tell us when to do it and how to do it. 
we give back to the community in which we are planted and placed in. You told us to stay in this community, to love and to help and to serve. And Lord, we're making every effort to do that. Bless now the gifts that come forward and let them be used for kingdom building purposes. In Jesus' name, all of those who love the Lord said amen. Come on, stand right where you are. Bring your gifts to the altar. If you've given electronically, God bless you and thank you. Um, just bring those gifts so that we can be a witness to what God would have us to do. Amen. Let's receive the gift. Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless you in the name of Jesus for every gift and for every giver. I pray now, dear God, for insight, wisdom, and courage to use these gifts in such a way that will be pleasing in your sight. Lord, when we see a need, let us not run from the need. Let us find creative me means by which we can help to resolve the problem. Let it be a blessing, dear God, for those who serve in the kingdom. Let it be a blessing for those who are in need. Let it be a blessing to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. All of those who love the Lord said amen. We're about to show a tribute, but let me give a little bit of a precursor testimony to the beautiful tribute that I think you're about to witness. It is a tribute to the life of two uh, men of God whom have recently departed from us, uh, one of them being uh, Pastor Willie Boyd, whom services were held on yesterday. Pastor Boyd was the pastor of the Greenwood CME Church, who had served here in the Mid-South area for many years, a uh, young man who was just a very gifted person, wonderful person, uh, went back to school not only in seminary, but to learn how to serve children who had special needs. He had a passion for that. And even when his career had already taken, his vocation of ministry had already taken off, uh, he wanted to serve children. And he went back to school to um, become better equipped in order to do that. That was a very monumental thing. And then the second person is Pastor William Young, Dr. William Young. Uh, Dr. William Young, good person, a great man. Um, one of my friends and teachers and taught me a very important lesson. I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, how many of y'all have ever been angry in your life? Okay. All right. How many of you are black? How many of you know that when you were born, you were angry? Okay. He taught me something about black anger. The anger that exists with just being born black in the United States of America. You can Google it. It's a real subject. Papers and documents have been written on it. And he talked about the circumstances that we face, African-American men and women. You know how when you walk into a restaurant sometimes and you don't get the same level of greeting that other people get? Or if you go in places and they question why you are there or should you be there or can you even afford to be there? Or they look at you while you're shopping, but they don't look at other people. 
Those are things that embed within us as black people in the United States of America. And it grows to be something that makes us angry. And he was one of the people who helped me to understand that God was big enough to handle our anger and sees us for who we are. And I called William, and I, I still, you know, I'm calling this even in death, the angriest black man I ever met before in my life. William could start a fight anywhere with anybody. I mean, anywhere. I remember one specific instance. He and Pastor Thomas O'Neill Crivens both gone on to be with the Lord. We were in Jekyll Island, Georgia, and William and Diane and myself and Alicia were in a restaurant, and it just looked like they didn't want to serve us fast as they were serving everybody else. So William decided he was going to point it out. He said, hey, what's taking y'all so long to get over here and serve us? I said, William, calm down. They're going to poison us. And he was just all over the place, I mean, and could start a fight better than anybody. One time we were in a group of pastors, and William and I were the only two African-American pastors there with his wife, Diane. There were 20 other pastors who were all Caucasian. And William told them, he said, I'll fight y'all. And I looked around and said, well, I guess that means I'm going to have to fight too. <laughs> because if he started a fight on, on some issue, then I was going to have to fight. And so here we are, the only two brothers in the group, and William ready to pick a fight. Thomas O'Neill Cribbins, the other one who's gone on to be with the Lord, had recently suffered a stroke. And Thomas talked slow, and he could not use his right arm. Thomas told him, he said, I get up and whoop all y'all. I whispered to Thomas, I said, Thomas, you can't even throw a blow. You got to hold your cane with your left hand, and your right arm is paralyzed. He said, but keep me, between me and you, we'll whoop all of them. I said, okay. So these were people, and especially William, who taught us that God loves us and understands us. Their works will be missed. Here's the video. I'll come back to you with the message right after. Not a second or another minute, not an hour or another day, but at this moment with my arms outstretched, I need you to make a way. done so many times before, through a window or open door, I stretch my hands to you, come and rescue me, I need you right away, I need you there. Not another minute, no, no, not an hour, no, another day, but Lord, I need you right away, as you have done so many times before, you showed up and restored all of the faith that I Let's live while I was yet searching the world for more. You're the truest friend I have in need. You're my best friend, I know indeed. I stretch my hands to thee. Come and rescue me. I need your eyes away. Test and 
trials in my life that came to make me strong. That feeling of guilt, her shame, and defeat. The ways of trials that beat upon me. But just to know, Lord, that in you I've got victory. Hey, I need you now. Lord, I need you now. I need you now. I need you now. All of these words mean so much more to me now in this stage of my life. Because I did. I've been there. I've been to the point to where I didn't know where to turn. I was angry. I was angry with God. This song that said you got to steal away, get down on your knees. I had to go there because I was in a, a state of depression. And I had to say, Lord, I need you now. I recognized where I was. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, 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 I stretch my hands to thee. Come and rescue me. I need your right. eyes. Um, so right, right here, be seated, right, right here is where, exactly where I want to be with this message. Um, thank you for these words, Terrence. These words mean so much more to me now. And so today's message is about maturing faith, right? Faith that grows with you as your life challenges grow. I, uh, I was dealing with some things on yesterday and throughout the course of the week. And I was writing and had written a message. And I said, Lord, this message is far too long uh, for tomorrow. And the Lord said, well, you know, just prepare to deal with the message and, you know, just follow instructions, okay? And then I, I, I encountered the things that we encountered this week, the passing of several colleagues, the sudden passing of, a former staffer who was near and dear to me. And then at the end of the day yesterday, I had a wedding. And I was like, okay. So in the running, the funeral, the hospital, the praying for Kevin, and you know, one of our members who suffered a stroke in the hospital, uh, thinking about a funeral tomorrow in Nashville, uh, one of our members' father that I got to run up there and be with, and then the wedding right there at the end. But it was the contrast that I was like, what is, Lord, what, what is this? But it was what took place at the wedding that the Lord said, I needed you to see the wedding after all this other stuff. At the wedding, I married a young lady, Jakara Calicut, who was 10 when she came to this church. And all of the bridesmaids and the groomsmen and other people were kids from this church who were now adults with children that I dedicated at the altar, that I taught in Sunday school at Sam Mickens Church and at Tabernacle. And I was like, wow, what is this? Am I getting that old? That now I'm now marrying the kids and now their kids are in their weddings? But what the Lord said to me, he said was, 
these kids had a seed of faith planted in them that has helped them, and they came up to me one by one and we were talking, that has helped them to grow and handle life's problems as life has gotten more difficult. And that's when it hit me. That's why the message had been written. And as I was walking through the park when I saw uh, Juanetta walking, she never speaks to me when we walk. She always has her coffee and has her earphones on, and she's being so prissy that she doesn't realize I'm out there walking and watching her. But uh, I was thinking about her as we were walking, that we need to have more than just uh, this church experience that always relies upon the spectacular to know that God is working. What do you mean by that? Uh, I was sharing with Kenya earlier this week. I said, we built a culture on miracles and manifestations that when we come to church, if something spectacular doesn't happen, we don't think God has moved. We don't think that God has spoken if nobody shouted or if nobody pulled it from the pulpit or no song was saying that made us cry and fall out on the floor. But God moves in the growing of our faith if we're listening. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if we're sharing the word of God and if we're in God's presence, it's not always something spectacular that has to happen for God to have work in your life. So every time you sit at the feet of the Lord and you hear the word of God, if you are absorbing and taking it in, something spectacular is happening. It just may not be happening on the outside. You may be growing in a way on the inside for an experience that you're going to have later in life that you need the faith that you're getting today for a tomorrow kind of problem. That said, that was, that, that was way up here, so let me just bring it down. You're getting something in the moment that you're in, whether you know it or not, for something that's going to happen later on. And if don't nobody else fall out in the floor, you ought to be happy that you're receiving from the word of the Lord. And so I want to talk about faith today because there are going to be some problems, there are going to be some situations, there are going to be some moments that come in life, and if you look around and you look at the person to your left, to your right, across the aisle, in front of you or behind you, I will be willing to bet you that when I ask them to raise their hand, have you experienced a moment within the last 30, 60, 90 days where if you had not had your faith in God, you would have lost your mind? Come on, let me see by a show of hands. Amen. If, if you had not had, if nothing else kept you, amen, nothing else kept you. Your checkbook didn't keep you. Your job didn't keep you. Your address didn't keep you. Your degrees didn't keep you. It was nothing but your faith in God that kept you from losing your mind. And so there are times and moments in life when we need to be centered and anchored and listen and hear and experience God just for what we get in the faith growth because all of the other things, I love the spectacular. I love it. I love it. I absolutely love it. I'm, I'm a church kid. I love church. But if you miss God's movement on the inside of you, you're going to miss the most important thing that the Lord wants to do. I want to walk through about five levels of faith. And this has nothing to do really with the meat of the message I got to get to today. But I want you to get this because I want you to talk, I want you to see how your faith progresses and your faith grows. Now, if you, um, if you, if you got to put a, a handle on this particular message, call it maturing faith, all right, maturing faith, all right? Um, but I want everybody to get this because we don't realize this in our own lives, but all of us have faith that should be growing. All of us have faith that should be growing, amen. All of us have faith that should be growing. And so I'm going to give you several passages of Scripture real quick. And, and really the heart of the message uh, is from another setting altogether. And I'll probably, if the Lord says the same, 
pull that in next Sunday at the 8 o'clock message. Uh, won't get a chance to do it at the 10 o'clock, so y'all will get the advantage of having part one and part two, and then maybe the 1030 folk will come to the 8 o'clock service and stay through the 1030 service next Sunday. I don't know. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a maturing faith. And listen, if I can help you with this, you're going to need it, and especially if you are young and you are growing old, all right? Uh, when you're young, I'm just opening up now, you, experience, you don't experience some things in your youthfulness always um, that you will experience later in life. The loss of loved ones, uh, disappointments and setback, life partners leaving you after 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, the, the experience of things uh, not being given to you that were promised to you on your jobs and in various places. And so you need a faith at that point that keeps you from really acting up and losing your mind. Uh, you need a faith to keep you from slapping folk. Amen. No matter, anybody got that? I, I got faith to keep from slapping you. Amen. How many of y'all ever been in that space in life? Come on, be real, all right? Let's see, I got some slappers in here this morning. Amen. And, and then you need that faith to keep you from uh, doubting yourself to, to wonder, what's wrong with me? Ain't nothing wrong with me. Ain't nothing wrong with me. Just because you didn't do what you were supposed to do, there's nothing wrong with me, all right? And so I'm going to walk through these levels of faith, and then I want to get to this message. First thing uh, God gives to all of us is a measure of faith. I want you to say that with me, a measure of faith, right? Everybody in here has what is called a measure of faith. Romans chapter 12, verse number 3 says, To each of us is given a measure of faith. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You need, a me you need just a little bit of faith, a measure of faith. Don't think so great of yourself. God gave everybody in here a measure of faith. Just enough faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Just enough faith for you to get up every day and to say God is in control, right? Just enough faith for you to approach God and give him your life as a, as a young person, as a child, as a mature person. Just a, just a measure of faith, right? Just a measure, a measure. Look at it like a span or something you can do with your fingers and just say, God gave me just this much faith right here. But now listen, if I don't continue to hear the word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, I can be a grown man with a little faith. I can be a 50-year Christian. Don't come in here talking about I've been in church all my life. Just because you've been in church all your life don't mean you've been growing all your life, right? So you can have a measure of faith, but if you don't mature and grow that faith, if you don't stay in the presence of God's word, and if you don't overcome some challenges in life, and if you don't learn how to toil and pray and stay in there and hang in there and endure hardship as a good soldier, your measure of faith will just be a measure of faith. And when big stuff start hitting you, you're going to have a measure of faith. You're gonna, you still believe God. God, I know you're there. God, I know you're able, right? But your confidence in how you respond will show up. You can see, you can, you can always see the difference between the people who have a measure of faith and people who got show enough faith. David, uh, David's brothers had a measure of faith. When Goliath was down in the valley and he was talking, they was up there on the mountain. They had a measure of faith. But David had strong faith. David said, no, nah, I'm going to go down here and fight the giant. Now, they were saying, what you talking about, man? You crazy. Saul was saying, David, you ain't, you ain't going to win. You ain't going to win. Let me tell you something. You can always tell the folk who only got a measure of faith. Those are the people who are standing on the sideline. They ain't going to never do nothing risky. They ain't never going any further than right there because they have a measure of faith. But to each of us have been given a measure. God gave everybody here. So, so don't think, don't, God gave it to us. That, that scripture tells us, don't think so highly of yourself. All of us got a measure of faith. But each of us should be moving to an area where we have growing faith. First Thess Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 3. Look at what it says. Uh, what is a growing faith? A growing faith is that steady progression, right? Steady progression. 
uh, uh, look at your neighbor and say, I'm making progress. I'm making progress. I'm making, it's just a little, little progress, right? I'm making a little, how, how many of us making, I'm better this time this year than I was this time last year, right? This time last year, I would have slapped you and I would have shook you. This year, I'm just going to shake you. I'm going to slap you, I'm just going to shake you, right? Next year, I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to roll my eyes and hold my head like this, but I ain't going to slap you or shake you. Yeah, after that, I'm just going to look at you and say, man, go, and walk away. But I'm growing. We thank God for you always. Here's what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We thank God for you always, and that's what we should do because you give us good reason to be thankful. Your faith is what? Uh-uh, you ain't saying nothing to me. Your faith is what? Growing. That's what it says. Your faith is growing more and more. So we started with what? A measure of faith. But now we have what's called a growing faith, right? Anybody got a growing faith right now? Just a, I'm glad, listen, I'm glad I have a growing faith, right? A growing faith moves you progressively from the measure that you had to be able to say day by day, I'm trusting God more and more, and the things around me don't shake me as much as they used to. I am growing in my faith. I'm growing. I don't respond to life the way I used to. I don't act out of character as much as I used to. As a matter of fact, I don't get as nervous as I used to. You know what? First time I got laid off, I started hiding the car, and I started doing all sorts of stuff because I started thinking, oh, they're coming to get this stuff, right? Next time I got laid off, I said, man, please, I'm going to find another job. I'm going to call these people because now I know how to handle situations. The first time something happened, you get real nervous. But then after you see God work in your life, you grow to the point, you have growing faith that you don't respond the way you used to. How does that happen? You can't run from everything that happens. Look at the text one more time. We thank God for you always, and that's what we should do because you give us good reason to be thankful. Your faith is growing more and more, and the love that every one of you has for each other is also growing. So as my faith grows, guess what? My love grows, right? As my faith grows, I treat people different. As my faith grows, my response to people and things around me is different, right? I want to just give you these five quick growing phases, and then I want to just intro where I got to get to in this example that I want to show you. So the first thing I had was what? A measure of faith. Come on, measure of faith, right? But then the second thing I have is what? A growing faith, right? I have a growing faith. So I have a measure of faith. Then I have growing faith. But then I get to the point where I have great faith. Come on, say that. Great faith. Amen. Great faith. Anybody in here got great faith? Yeah, you got great faith. Some of you got some great faith. Some of y'all got great faith just because of some of the stuff you've endured. Amen. The fact that you are here and hadn't lost your mind and thrown in the towel with some of the things you've experienced, you got great faith. Because the truth of it is, if we did not have a growing faith that gives way to a great faith, many of us would have checked out by now. Great faith, amen. It's possible to have great faith. Where do you see it in the Bible? Matthew chapter 8. Go look at it. 8, chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Here is an example of a great faith. Now listen, before you pray and say, God, give me great faith, remember great faith comes by trial. God, I want great faith. All right. I did not find one example of great faith in Scripture where the people had not been catching hell. I did not find one example of great faith, and I found several. But the one thing all of them had in order to have great faith, whenever Jesus said great faith, there was persecution and trial all around. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. This is when the centurion had said, come, my servant is sick, but only speak a word that my servant will be healed. Look at how Jesus responds. Uh, he said, for I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Here is a man who he says, I don't believe you got to come to my house in order for my servant to be healed. I don't believe you got to physically be up. 
I don't believe you got to travel in order to make it happen. Here's what he says. Speak a word from right where you are. And if you speak a word from right where you are, healing can get to my house. That's great faith right there. I wish I had somebody in here who did not always need God to do the miraculous manifestation in order to believe that just by his word, he can accomplish what he wants to accomplish. When you fall on your knees and you say, Lord, move in a mighty way, you ain't got to see nothing happen around you in order for your heart to know it. He said, that's great faith right there. He said that about John the Baptist. What came you out to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Did you think he was going to be over here sitting here crying and upset? He said, there's not a greater faith in all of the kingdom. He said, that's great faith right there. But great faith comes by trial. Great faith comes through experience. Great faith comes through the things that you've extracted lessons from and learned how to endure. Great faith comes when you still get up and put your clothes on and go on to church anyhow, and you ain't got no money in your pocket, but you get up and go anyway. Great faith is when you keep on wearing makeup and getting your hair cut and say, I'm going to look good even if I can't afford it. Lord, help me in here. Great faith is what kept our parents and our ancestors from losing their mind when they sat in balconies where the masters who had abused them sat on the floor and they sat up there and shouted anyway because they believed God was a deliverer. Great faith is what allows women who have breast cancer to keep on living and cooking and feeding their children and keep on going, surviving. Great faith is what causes people to get up and keep going to jobs that they can't stand the boss on, but but they know they got to make a living for their family and God will provide. I wish I had some folk that had great faith in here. Great faith. I, I start with a measure. I start with a little. I, I just start with enough to get to know who God is. I start with a little faith, measure. But it grows, right? And then when it grows, it gets to the point where I can have great faith. Great faith. Great faith. Anybody been sick? Did you believe God could heal you? Did he do it? If you get sick again, what you going to do? You going to ask the same God who did it before, do it again? Great faith. Anybody ever experienced the same diagnosis more than one? Great faith. You keep on believing and hoping in your future? Great faith. You don't let the enemy wipe out what he's trying, what, what, what someone else is trying to do in your life. Great faith, right? Great faith. And so great faith comes through many trials. It comes through many turmoil, right? So I got a measure of faith, right? But I nurtured it. I've held on to it. I keep trying to bring it before God. I keep letting the word speak to my faith. Then it becomes a growing faith. Then through trial and experience, I mature and I get a great faith. But now I want some unwavering faith. Now, you know wavering is when you go back and forth. Right? Now, you ain't got to say nothing to me. You ain't got to wave your hand or nothing. But if I ask you who in here had a measure of faith, and you said amen. I can also tell you, you also have wavering faith, right? Because that's what, you know, faith kind of goes back and forth. It starts there, and you start, you know, but then, I don't know. Stuff start presenting itself, right? Your eyes get in the way, right? You know, Peter, Jesus, if you believe, I, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you, right? And Jesus said, come. So Peter, great faith, right? Walk on what? Water, right? And the Bible says, but he saw the wind. Now, ain't nobody in here never seen the wind before. You ain't never seen the wind. You saw wind blow leaves. You saw wind move stuff, but what got in your way that caused you to be able to see what nobody has ever been able to see? 
Peter is now exercising great faith, but because his faith wavered, he begins to sink. What happens to everybody in here, help me, Holy Ghost, even the most sanctified of saints, you will have a moment in your life where your faith will begin to waver because you are stacked up against some odds that you've never seen before. And when you start looking at stuff you ain't never seen before, man, it get rough. I ain't never had these many bills at the same time, Lord. <laughs> Lord, all my children acting up at the same time. I'm used to one of them being out of sync in this season, and not, but now all of them, Lord. Lord, everything. The Bible says, and there was a day in the life of Job when everything showed up at the same time. Both my parents are sick. And I was having trouble taking care of one of them. But now, Lord, I got to deal with mama and dad. And I got six or seven sisters and brothers who won't answer their phone. Lord, help me in here. God looked like I was just getting this bill down and I was just getting this paid off. And then I looked up and there was a leak in the roof. Where did that come from? Here I am now working on that. Doggone car, I just paid that thing off, and Lord help me. They got a diagnosis that say they don't know what's wrong with my car. Here I was, tired of every Sunday and stuff. I better hold a little bit of this back. I'm wavering. Listen, listen, I ain't mad at nobody. Here's what script says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without what? Waver. Without waver. That's hard. That's hard. I, can, I, can, I, can I tell y'all something? Y'all ain't going to ask me not to be the pastor no more. I waver back and forth sometimes. I know what's right, and I know what God said. Sometimes the wavering is just, I don't want to do it. Do I have any friends in here today? I mean, y'all just going to let me walk out there by myself. Sometimes I heard exactly what God said. I read it. I preached it to y'all and explained it to you. I could say it in Greek, Hebrew, and in Aramaic. But at this particular moment in time, I just don't feel like it. And I'm a little wavery on that. Not because of what you said, but I'm wavery because the outcome involves people. And whenever the outcome of what God says involves people, I'm a little shaky on that. Can I just get real common with you for a moment? Negroes will act up sometimes. And just because you do what God tells you to do, don't ensure that they're going to act right. Do I have any witnesses in here? God tell you to go and apologize and treat them right, and you go over and humble yourself and do everything God tell you to do, and they act the same way they was acting before the problem started. Then you want to get up with God and say, why would you tell me to do this, and they ain't held to a different standard. I want to waver when it comes to stuff like that. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. That's what makes me waver. Sometimes I waver because I don't like the potential outcome. Because I can't control what happens. Unwavering faith is hard to arrive at. You think you go through something to get great faith, but unwavering faith? really something. Let me keep moving. I got to get out. 
strong faith. That's my fifth progression. I want a strong faith. I want faith that just, just everyday part of my life that's strong, right? I want a first response faith that every time the problem presents itself, my first response is God will. God is. God can. Now, let me clarify that because I have some extra biblical folk in here who can't answer a question without saying God, right? Who made the cornbread? The Lord did. Where did you buy them light bulbs? Jesus showed me. I ain't talking about y'all, amen. Some of y'all so holy that you ain't, I mean, come on. What's your favorite cocktail? A Jesus Manhattan. Come on in this house. You know ain't no such thing. Am I doing all right in the back? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want a, a response in my faith where when I am hit, and, and listen, I'm, you remember I told you this is a maturing faith, right? I've been hit with some big stuff, right? I'm talking about the stuff, listen, listen. I ain't talking about a sinus infection response. I'm talking about wait for 12 days before we give you the test result. Faith. I told somebody the other day, Ms. Smith, uh, the stress is not always in the response. Sometimes it's in the wait. We see something in your body that ain't right. We're going to run some tests. We're not sure what it is. And we can get you in in two weeks. Hell, I, my hair started falling out then. Because you just told me you saw something that wasn't right and you don't like it. And I got to wait two weeks before I even get the CAT scan. And then you're going to take another week after that to tell me what's on it. So you mean between now and the next 21 days, you want me to be all right? Oh, I'm already sick, right? I went home and Googled everything you said, everything I said. I done gave myself about five sicknesses, and four of them are incurable. I know y'all don't never do that. That's why I said it. But for the 10 of y'all who do do it, come on, say amen. God, I need a strong faith. Listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I got to make a true confession. I got to make a true confession. One of the things that I avoided as a young pastor was a hip-hop approach to the gospel. I did that because I knew that if every sermon I preached was based on pop culture, a movie title, and a song, that one day the people who I preached to were going to outgrow it. It would have attracted a younger crowd. But when they start growing up, they start getting problems that the rap artists didn't sing about. I have never heard a rap artist talk about cancer. I've never heard a rap artist talk about, you done left me with all these children, now I got to take care of them by myself. B.B. King did in the blues. <laughs> but here's what I'm saying. In a maturing ministry, a maturing congregation, where people start here and grow up, they need a faith that grows with them. Amen? They need faith that engages them with God. That's a measure of faith. They need faith that grows as they grow in the Lord. That's a growing faith. They need faith that keeps on maturing beyond the growing phase to become a great faith. They need a faith 
that eventually becomes an unwavering faith, but they need to get to a point where they have a strong faith. Here's what strong faith does. Strong faith says that when the problem comes, I ain't got to call the pastor and get the pastor to pray for me. I'm going to stand right here and pray for myself. As a matter of fact, by the time the pastor know about it, I might be that I already came through it and said, Pastor, the Lord has brought me through some things, and I just want you to know it is because of my faith that I've been able to endure. Do I have anybody in here that ain't got to run here and there and get the latest this or that, but you got faith on the inside that to hold you when you need it. See, you got to have a strong faith because you're going to run into some stuff. I wish I had somebody in here. You're going to run into some things in your life that won't go away easily. You're going to run into some spots in life where your faith has to be strong. Watch it this. Look at this passage of Scripture with me. Strong faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 20. This is about Abram. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He staggered not. When it hit him, he didn't fall out. He didn't, he didn't panic. He didn't rip and run. He didn't go here and there. I, I, I told y'all this before, but yeah, everybody has a, a, an example of some faith in your life that you can look at, that you need to remember. And it may not have been yours. It may have been a borrowed experience. And some of your best faith experiences don't come from highly spiritual people. See, you know, we know how to practice the right stuff. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. You tore up from the flow up and just don't want to say it. How's the day? It's a great day in the Lord Jesus Christ. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Fifteen minutes later, you somewhere blues, despair, and agony on me. Greatest example of faith, I'm finished, I'm done. It's 9.05, you got to go to Sunday school in a few minutes. Was my dad. Quiet, didn't say much or nothing. Laid back, low key. You sit over there with the brothers at church. Lisa Allen's dad, my dad, my Uncle B. They came to church at 8 o'clock so they could go home and eat and drink. And I ain't talking about Kool-Aid. They came and got their church out the way at about 8 o'clock in the morning, right? Y'all can have all the suits you want to have on. They had on blue jeans and shirts, and they ready to go now. And anything past 9, no, man, you're holding us up. They're going to eat their breakfast. Then they're going to watch a little football. And then from now on, you know what time it is. Growing up to be a lot like my dad. Y'all will catch that on the way home. My dad thought he had a broken ankle or ankle problem from years ago when his ankle was broken. He goes to the VA to get checked out. They admit him to the hospital because he doesn't have a broken ankle, but they can't figure out what's wrong with him. He stays in the hospital several days and they run tests and they can't figure it out. I move him from one hospital to another hospital, to Baptist, and we begin to run tests on him, only to find out that what he thought was a bad ankle that was having some swelling was stage four cancer, leukemia, blood cancer, incurable, can't get around it. Doctor comes in the room while this dude is laying in the bed watching a baseball game. I'm sitting there with him. He says, Mr. Norman, both of us say yes, because we're both Mr. Norman. He said, I'm talking to the patient. I said, OK. He said, I have some news. And he begins to give my father what I perceive is the worst news of his life. 
this is it, man. Ain't nothing. We can't do anything about this is where we are, so forth, so on. And he tells them all of that and says, I'm sorry, but the treatment options are very few. Dad never flinches. I look at him. I said, are you okay? Now, I said, did you understand that? He said, no. He said, did you understand it? I said, yeah. He said, well, as long as you understand it, I'm going to be all right. He said, because that's why I got you here. Then he started back watching television. I said, well, how are you? He said, I'm fine. How are you? I said, I I'm pretty shaken. I said, well, let me ask you something else. How is your soul? He looks back at me and says these words. You tell me. I said, I can't tell you how your soul is. He said, well, everything I know about death and dying and the soul, you taught me. He said, so did you teach me right? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I'm all right then. He said, because I can't do nothing about what the doctor just said. But if you have told me what I needed to know, then this day been coming for a long time. He said, change the channel. The Cubs are on another station. And get me some chocolate ice cream. And from that day until he passed, he never cried, flinched, or said a mumbling word because his faith held him for something that man couldn't help him with. I wish I had somebody in here that you got to have a faith that grows with the problems that you face because if your faith is not mature, you won't be able to handle some things that lie ahead. I'm finished. I'm done. Next week, I'll get to the text. This was the introduction. Come on, stand with me. I got a measure of faith. Thank you for giving me that. Thank you, God, that you gave me a little faith to trust in you. To believe that you are. To come to you knowing who you are. Thank you for a measure of faith. Thank you for growing my faith. I hung around. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. My faith has grown. I've survived some things. When I was a child, I spake as a child, but now I'm a man, so I put away childish things. I've survived some stuff. But then I moved from my measure of faith to my growing faith, now, God, I'm in that area of great faith. It hadn't been easy. I've been hit with some stuff. My faith didn't get as big as it is because I've been walking around here looking cute. Man, I had to cry sometimes. I had to hurt sometimes. I lost friends and loved ones. I've been through some sickness. I've had some uncertainty. I've had folk who promised me they were going to be with me to walk away from me. I have gone through lies and heartaches and I had great faith, though. But then, God, I'm getting to that unwavering faith. I just got to the point where I must find my spot in you and I'm going to stand there and watch you work. I'm going to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It's not easy because sometimes I want to move. Sometimes I want to get out of that spot. Sometimes I want to quit. I want to give up. I want to walk away. But you told me to stand there and not waver. But now, Lord, you're making some strong faith in me. That my first response is not to panic, but it is to say God is able. Father, thank you for my faith. Thank you for my faith. Thank you that when I was a child, I trusted you. I began to be curious about you. I've gone through some stages in life and 
ups and downs and highs and lows. But Lord, now I'm at a point where my faith is growing and maturing. Hadn't been easy. I want to move into this space in my life, God, where when I have to wait, I have to wait. When I have to sit on the mountain for six days and you only speak on the seventh day, I'll be all right. Thank you for a faith that is growing and maturing. Now, Lord, strengthen me. I don't know what lies ahead. I only know that it was by faith that I'm here and faith and grace will lead me on. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. All of those who love the Lord said amen. amen. If you're here and you're looking for a place, watch this, for your faith to be strengthened. And, and let me tell you this. You need a community around you so when your faith starts wavering and you start wobbling, they won't point you out and talk about you. They'll just stand beside you and hold you up. They'll get close to you. And when you start leaning, won't nobody even know it because they standing there. And then when you start leaning, won't nobody know it because they standing there with you. That's how, say, that's how faith works sometimes, y'all. Sometimes you're with some folk that just remind you of your song when you forget the words to it. Sometimes folk just remind you that you got more in you than you realize. But you need to be in a faith community that helps your faith to mature. If you're here and you want to be a part of that, would you come now? Where is your faith in God? Come on, let's just sing that as we dismiss on today. They can move mountains oh faith will open the fountain oh faith will help you to succeed oh faith will supply your every need faith to him who is able to keep us from falling according to the faith that works in us. To him be glory, majesty, and power. To the only wise God, we submit our faith to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, all of those who love the Lord said amen. Go in the peace that only God can give. Amen. Oh, faith will the fuck?